And good morning, everybody. It's so good to be able to welcome you on this very special day. This may be your first or second, third time joining us online, but we're just glad to have you here. Happy Easter from the Butlers. This is Brooke from Watertown, and I just want to wish you and your families a happy Easter. Hello, CIC family. Happy Easter from Florida. Happy Easter, Easter from Joe and Sarah in Arlington. Happy, Happy Easter, Easter from, from the Chisholm family. family. Happy Easter. <laughs> Happy Easter, guys, from the Machabaya crew. Happy Easter, guys. Hope you stay safe. Ha Happy Easter. Hope everyone has a good Sunday. And may you all stay safe and goodbye. <laughs> oh, no. Goodbye, guys. Happy, Happy Easter, Easter from, from the Corgans. Corgans. Happy Easter, Easter from, from the Nowaks. Happy Easter from the Quiet. Happy Easter from, from the Websters and Dedham. Happy Easter from Texas. Good morning, Charles River family. Wishing you a happy Easter. And remember what our father taught us. He gave us the tools to survive. We will survive. From the Cole family to everybody out there. Happy Easter. Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed. Our hope is in Christ. Happy Easter, everyone. Hey, what's up, CRC? We are the Mangrums. Happy Easter uh, from Charlestown and Christ Church Charlestown. We love you guys. Happy Easter from the Robinson. Happy Easter from the Rando family. He is risen. risen. Happy Easter from the Murphys. Well, that was so great. Love it. Hopefully that was really encouraging to some of you to see some familiar faces. Just so glad that you guys are with us today for Easter. This is our first time having Easter entirely online, and we're going to make the best of it as we Easter from home. Listen, I know that we're living in some challenging times, but know this, Easter is about hope. Easter is about life. Easter is about victory. Ultimately, Easter is about the death of death, that Jesus became a man and he defeated death for you and for me. And so our prayer is that you will experience that hope and that victory and that life as we gather together like this today. Listen, fully aware that gathering online like this is different. Uh, maybe it's challenging for your attention. Some of you right now, you're bouncing babies on your lap. Maybe you have a pet on your lap. Uh, some of you, you have kids in the room with you who are already hyped up on Easter chocolate. And so I get it, I get it. It's, it's, it's a different kind of thing. But what we're gonna do is a, just an attempt to kind of keep everybody engaged is throughout the gathering, we're gonna make some things interactive. And so I hope you can engage with us. And so here's how we're gonna start that together. Uh, if you will, just take a moment to look at the chat chat section on your screen there and just let us know that you're joining us. So in the chat section there, just maybe type hi from in your city, your neighborhood, your state, uh, maybe other country that you're from. So go ahead and do that now. Let us know that you're with us. And then also pay attention. There's a heart button there. If you want to click that button, you want to smash that heart anytime, go ahead and feel free to do that. And then also uh, look at the top of your screen there. There's a connection card. And if you would take some time at some point, whether it's now or towards the end of our gathering and just fill out that connection card, let us know that you're here. Let us know how we can be praying for you. We'd be really grateful. So thank you in advance just for engaging with us in that way. Listen, we know that you are quarantined from home, but we want you to know that God sees you. God knows you by name and God cares. And he wants the hope of Easter to flood your home and to flood your heart right now. And so as we begin our gathering, we've compiled some scripture together just to help you to set your heart on Easter. And so I'm gonna pray. And then when I say amen, you take some time with the people that you're gathered with right now, or if you're by yourself and just read that scripture aloud and then we'll get into some time of singing. Let me pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Easter. God, I pray that you would inject hope and peace and life and victory into the people who are with us right now. We give this time to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.
The fear that held us now gives way to him who is our peace. His final breath upon the cross is now alive. It's because of your spirit we can say That by your spirit I will rise From the ashes of defeat Cause the resurrected King Is resurrecting me And in your name I come alive To declare your victory Cause the resurrected King is resurrecting me By your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat Cause the resurrected King is resurrecting me In your name I come alive to declare your victory The resurrected King is resurrecting me by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me in your name I come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting cross on our behalf 2,000 years ago. I thank you that the same spirit that rose Christ Jesus from the dead now dwells in us, God. It is because of that spirit that we are allowed to sit here, wherever we are, in our houses, in our offices, in our gyms, I don't know, wherever we are, we're allowed to sit there or stand there and be, and be called sons and be called daughters. So thank you for that, God. In your name, amen.
Well, thank you, artist Olivia Aaron. Really grateful for you guys leading us in that way. Hey, my prayer is that those lyrics will just continue to resonate in your heart, that the name of Jesus means victory, victory over sin, victory over death, victory really over all of your defeats. So we were defeated, but God became a man, Jesus, and he offers victory to us. In the name of Jesus, we get life, life abundantly and life eternally if we would look to him. So who knows, maybe today coming together like this, you'll get something that you didn't even know that you were looking for in Jesus. Uh, as a child, every Easter, we'd go over to my grandfather's house and we'd take some photos in our Easter pastels and we'd have a great big Easter meal together. But then towards the end of the meal, some uncles and some older cousins would often slip off and they'd put together this epic Easter egg hunt for all of us kids. And it was so much fun, loved it, always looked forward to it every year. But there was always one uncle who would then take one particular egg and he would put some cash in there, either a $10 bill or a $20 bill, and we were so psyched about getting the egg with cash. I don't know what you would choose, but I was always cash over candy every single time. Well, since we as a church are unable to have our typical church Easter egg hunt or the neighborhood-wide Easter egg hunt this year, what I did is earlier this week uh, from my house and around the neighborhood, I put together a little virtual Easter egg hunt for all the kiddos tuning in. And so here's what you're gonna be looking for, kids. As we're doing an egg hunt, you're not looking for lots of eggs, you are looking for one egg, you are looking for the coveted golden egg. There's no cash, just a spray painted gold egg. And so this is what you're looking for. Join in for the virtual Easter egg hunt now. Okay, so we're gonna begin the virtual egg hunt inside of my house. And so kids, as soon as you see that golden egg, just tap that heart button to let us know that you found it.
All right, well done. I love egg hunts and kids. We have some more for you parents. If you'll click the notes section at the end of our time together, we have a link there for just more activities, Bible lessons for the kiddos so that they can just grow to know and love Jesus more and more, especially this Easter season. Hey, here's the deal. Uh, we just want to go ahead and tell you up front that we believe that the number one thing that you should be seeking, the very best thing that we can find is not the coveted golden egg or the cash egg. We believe that the best thing that you can find this Easter is God. Easter's all about Him. It's all about Him. And so here's the thing. God doesn't make us go searching for Him. He tells us plainly. He tells us that He's going to send a Savior into the world. Isaiah tells us that He's going to be a suffering servant who would be pierced for our sins, but by His wounds we would be healed. Uh, Jesus Himself tells us that if you see me, you have seen the Father. The writer of Hebrews tells us that in these last days, God has spoken to us by His Son. And so listen, God doesn't make us go searching for him. He tells us plainly, if you want me, you look to Jesus. You look to Jesus. And so what I want to do is I want to take a few moments now to look together at a story of a person who found Jesus. Her name is Mary, Mary Magdalene. In Mark chapter 16, if you want to go ahead and turn there in your paper Bible or uh, in your church app, our church app, if you want to download that, has a Bible there, and then we'll also put it on the screen for you. In Mark chapter 16, we learn a little bit about Mary. Mary was from the town of Magdala in Israel. She's known as Mary Magdalene. It's such a popular name, Mary. It'd be like calling someone Boston Joe. And so Mary, she is a, an incredibly special person. One, because she gets the very first mention in the Easter story. And two, because she's the first person to see Jesus alive that Easter morning. So check it out with me. Mark chapter 16, uh, beginning verse 1, says, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. So we have two Marys and we have Salome heading to the tomb of the crucified, deceased Jesus and their plans were to get there and to anoint the body of Jesus as was customary. Pick up in verse 2. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And so they go to anoint the body of Jesus. However, to their surprise, when they get there, that massive stone that was rolled in front of the entrance of the tomb had been rolled back. Verse 5. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples. So they go inside the empty tomb, and there's no Jesus. But there is an angel who says, as angels often do, Fear not. You seek Jesus, who is crucified. But he is risen. He's alive. Ladies, go tell the boys. Go tell the disciples. For me, this is just circumstantial evidence to the validity of the resurrection of Jesus because in that day, women's testimony was not admissible in court. And so if you're going to make up a religion, you're certainly not going to have the first eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus uh, be women. But that's how it happened. That's how it was recorded. So these ladies saw the empty tomb first. And Mary, we'll see in just a bit here, sees the resurrected Jesus first. Now, what I want to do, what I want us to consider is why. Why does Mary of all people get the first mention? And why does Mary of all people get the first appearance of Jesus on Easter? Because what we could do is we could just easily read through this story and think, wow, lucky Marys and Salome, lucky ladies, right place, right time. Could have been any one of the disciples or these ladies, but you'd be wrong because as you read the Bible, it's very clear that there are no such thing as coincidences in God's plan. God chooses specific people to show us today some things and to, to speak into their lives in specific ways. And for Mary Magdalene, it wasn't luck. She gets to see the empty tomb right here. She also gets to see an angel. But how did she get here? How did she get here? For that, we've got to look back to the beginning of her story. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 8 for a minute. Uh, the beginning of her story, Luke chapter 8, we, we see that Mary is, she's known as really the most devoted disciple, follower of Jesus in the Bible. She's one of the most uh, greatest examples of just high devotion, even though she has a very low beginning. And so Luke chapter 8 is where we first hear of her. Luke chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Soon afterwards, he, Jesus, uh, went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve 
were with him. And so earlier in the ministry of Jesus, Jesus is traveling and he's teaching about God's kingdom and his 12 disciples were with him. And so often when we hear that, our minds just kind of stop there. Jesus and his boys. And we rarely pay attention to verse two. Verse two says, and also some women. Listen, do not forget about the women. The ladies were a key part of the ministry of Jesus. These godly women were integral to the ministry of Jesus. Now, who were these women? Verse two, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. So Mary's start is demonic. It's horrific oppression. It starts with demons, but as we see, it ends with angels at the tomb. Verse three, and Joanna, the wife of Chuza, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided with them out of their means. So we've got some strong, strong women. We've got the devoted Mary. We've got uh, essentially Herod's White House chief of staff. Uh, we have old Susanna, and we have many others. This is Jesus's team, the 12 men and some amazing women. And, and Luke has been referred to as the gospel of womanhood because he just will not let you overlook the ladies. Mary, 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 Elizabeth, Anna, Joanna, and Susanna, these amazing women. Mary, Mary, it was no coincidence that she is included in this most incredible moment, that very first Easter Sunday. Because for her, walking with Jesus closely was a way of life. At her beginning, we see that she hit absolute rock bottom, but then Jesus changes her life. And following Jesus had become her way of life. That's how she lived. Now we're going to come to John chapter 20. And John picks up where Mark 16 uh, left off the story of Mary, Mary, and Salome. And they see the empty tomb. And the angel says, go and tell the disciples. And so John chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Now, pause there. I, I just love this. Understand that this is John's account of the life of Jesus. And whenever John makes mention of himself, he calls himself the one whom Jesus loved. He's either being really humble or he's uh, just wanting everybody to know Jesus loved me. Either he's being humble and I don't want to mention my name or, hey, I'm just trying to let everybody know that Jesus loves me. And can I just go ahead and say this to you, that you can let that be your own nickname, that you're the one who Jesus loved. I'm the one who Jesus loved. And so it's not just for John, it's for all of us. Jesus loved us. Verse two. And so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, there he goes again, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they've laid him. And so Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the disciple, the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Just saying. Me and Peter ran to the tomb. And for the record, I won. I love that, <laughs> boys. Verse five. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Okay, so I beat Peter to the tomb and then I stood outside in reverence, but Peter, the slow one, he just barges on in there after me and he's stomping all around all over the place. Now, verse eight, he says, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first. He, we can't stop him. He just keep, he just keep uh, you know, continuing to focus on the fact that he's, he's the fast one. But the, the, the disciple who reached the tomb first, he also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. The disciples went back to their home. Did you catch that? They went back to their home. Mary, deeply devoted to Jesus, woke up early to go anoint the body of Jesus. He wasn't there. Instead, an angel says, Go and tell the other disciples. Mary goes and tells the other disciples. And when she comes back, John and Peter come with her. John gets there first, in case you didn't know. The guys look into it and they confirm, you're right, he's not there. But then what happens? John chapter 20, verse 10. The disciples went back to their homes. Verse 11, but Mary, she stayed back. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. See, Mary didn't want to leave. Mary was devoted. 
Mary was devoted. You know what, guys? I, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay. For Mary, Jesus was all that she wanted. For Mary, Jesus meant everything to her. And she says, you know what? I'm not going anywhere. Without Jesus, I'm nothing. I'm just going to stay right here. And so I believe with this heart posture, it is no coincidence that Mary is the first to see the empty tomb. Mary is the first to be able to have the privilege to run and tell people Jesus is alive. Yes, I'm a preacher, but you know that Mary was the very first preacher. Mark chapter 16, the angel tells her, go and tell the disciples. She was the very first person to go and to preach the resurrection of Jesus. And it's no coincidence that Mary is the first person to see Jesus alive. Check it out. Verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she went, stooped to look in the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. This is an amazing moment for Mary in her life. Mary is the very first to see the resurrected Jesus. To recap, She's weeping outside the tomb. She stoops down to look into the tomb. Peter, John, long gone, but there are two now angels inside of the tomb. And they ask her, why are you weeping? She answers, they've taken my Lord's body. And then she turns around looking out of the tomb and she sees a man in the garden. I kind of picture Forest Hill Cemetery and you go there and there's just beautiful gardens all over the cemetery. Uh, and, and so there's, there's a man in the garden and, and she doesn't realize who it is, but it's Jesus. And he's somehow obscured to her. Maybe he's covered by some brush or maybe he's turned sideways. She doesn't recognize that it's him. And, and so from afar, he says, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? And she answers, sir, if you've carried him away, please tell me, please just tell me, I, I want to take him. But then here, here's the moment, verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. Mary. He calls her by name. And in that moment, she immediately realizes it's Jesus. And she responds, Rabboni or a rabbi. Now, what happened? What happened in that moment that gave her the recognition of Jesus? It was the fact that he called her by name. He said, Mary. And we all know that remembering somebody's name is really important, whether you're in sales or, or you have some clients, you want to know their names. It, it shows that I, I know you, I see you, I care about you, you are, are valuable to me. Maybe you've had somebody who's, who's maybe desirable to you and they've called you by name. It's somebody who, when you're around them, your heart kind of flutters, but they, they, they say your name and you say, they, they know my name. And it feels like a tremendous pr privilege. My only claim to fame was uh, I was, uh, for four or five seconds, had an appearance in the movie Remember the Titans with Denzel Washington. Yeah, that's right. I co-starred with Denzel. Uh, one night uh, in the, sh the, the shooting of the film, I was able to get about 10 feet from Denzel. Now imagine, though, if Denzel turns and looks to me and goes, Josh? Josh Wyatt? Hey, how are you? Of course, that would never happen because I'm a nobody to Denzel Washington. I'm, a, I'm an absolutely nobody to him. But listen, Jesus is, is across the garden and he's speaking with her and there, there's nothing. But in this moment, when he says her name, immediately there's recognition. Because I imagine for, for a few years now, Mary has been basking in the reality that I know Jesus like I know God and he knows me and he knows me by name. And so I imagine that every time he said her name, Mary, that she just welled up with worth and with value that God knows me and God knows me by name. And so here in this moment, when he finally says her name, it clicks, that's Jesus. And again, remember where she came from. She came from seven demons 
within her. That doesn't necessarily literally mean seven literal demons. When, when God created things, seven is kind of a, a number that, that means completion. So there's seven days in a week, there's seven colors in a rainbow, there's seven notes in a scale. But seven demons means that she was completely filled up by the demonic. Mary had hit rock bottom. Mary was far from God. Mary had been tossed aside by the rest of the world. And yet Jesus just a few years earlier, had brought her into his story. He saw her and he healed her and he gave her a hope and he gave her a future. He has great plans for her life. And so she, of course, gladly follows him. What a privilege, what a gift to get to walk with Jesus. Of course, I'm gonna devote my life to him. Now, here's the challenge for, for so many of us today. We live in a culture of comfort. We live in this historical moment with just this abnormal security that that throughout most of history just wasn't present. We live in wealth. We live in uh, first world problems with with modernity. And and so many of us have never really experienced a sense of need for God, like a deep need for God like she did. But it doesn't mean that we don't need God. We all need God. God. And and I think oftentimes our comfort is keeping us from calling out to God. This this COVID-19 situation that we find ourselves, it's a very unique season in in, in our world and in our own personal histories. It's a season where we're being reminded of the frailty of life. And my prayer is that, first of all, I'm praying for this thing to come to an end. But until that day, my prayer is that as we realize our frailty, that God would use us as a catalyst for us to call out to him and say, yeah, you know, we too, we too deeply need you, God. We we need you. And that we would be reminded in our our pain and in this trial that God sees us, God loves us. And that like Jesus called out to Mary by name, even right now, you would have this sense of God knows your name and that you would get this overwhelming sense that it's a tremendous privilege that the God of the universe, he sees you, he knows you, and he died for you. And and your story is probably radically different from Mary's, but just like Mary, you desperately need him. The Bible says that there is no one righteous, no, not one. I love that comma right there. There is no one righteous. And in case you were going to say, no, no, but I'm pretty good. He goes, oh no, not one. There is no one righteous, no, not even one. The Bible says in that the wages of our sin is, is death, that we will all die. But the verse will go on and say, but the free gift of God is eternal life. That yes, we've all sinned and the result of that is death, but the free gift of God, what God wants to give you for free is eternal life. And it comes, it goes on in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I love that Mary referred to Jesus as our Lord, my Lord. They have taken away my Lord. My my question to all of us today is, would you make Jesus your Lord? That you have a problem, you you, you sin against God, and, and your transgression means that you will die, and you will die eternally. But God says, I love you so much, I'm not gonna leave you in that state. God becomes one of us, Jesus, and he walks perfectly in our shoes perfectly this human life and he never sins he never deserves the wages of sin which is death but he chose to die on a cross for you and for me but he didn't stay in the grave he resurrects three days later as we celebrate today because he is victorious over sin and death and so you can look to him and you can trust in him and you can call on his name and he'll say i know you i see you i died for you and i want to give you new and eternal life as we close out, I want you to think back with me for just a moment on that, that coveted cash prize egg, that one egg that's worth more than all the others. Uh, since money was in play, oftentimes the older kids would just ignore the toddlers and we would just barrel over the toddlers to go uh, get that big cash prize egg. They're getting the obvious eggs on the, on the grass there, but we're going to find that cash prize egg. Now here's the deal. What's impressive at the end of that when we get these great eggs and somebody gets the cash prize egg? What was impressive was not the fact that, that we were able to push toddlers aside and find that one egg. What's really more impressive is that uncle who was willing to sacrifice his cold hard cash for our joy. And and in a weird way, that's kind of the message of the gospel. That's what we call the good news of Jesus. The message of the gospel is is not that we're so impressive in our effort to go find this great prize of, of Jesus, but what's impressive is that God himself would sacrifice so much for us so that we could have the joy of having a relationship 
with God? Did, did Mary do anything to earn the favor of God? No, she did nothing to earn the favor of God. She was uh, trapped in her oppression, demonic oppression. It was, it was a horrible situation, but God did this impressive, amazing work. God earned her salvation for her. I think many of us today, we're, we're struggling in this COVID-19 season because our, our output with our work is just not quite the same with homeschooling children while also trying to work and not having the same tools and resources that we might have if you were to go uh, into an office or, or your regular place of work. And so maybe your productivity is not quite the same and maybe you're having trouble with that because you're not outputting as much as you used to. And, and it's hard when your identity can really be wrapped up in, in what you do in your productivity. And I, I just just want to say, let that remind you of the gospel. Would you just let that remind you of, of the message of Jesus, that it's not about your productivity, that you can rest in the fact that we're going to try and try and try and try, and we cannot earn God's favor. It's all about what God has done for us. Not that we earn his favor and work our way up to God, but that God came down to earth and God gave us life by living in our shoes and dying our death and resurrecting. So he says, here's the deal. This is not religion. God's not calling you to religion. He's not calling you to try to earn his favor. He is calling you just to say, you know what? You're the, you're the one who gave me this amazing gift. It's not my performance, it's you. And so I wanna turn from my own trying to, to, to impress you, God. And, and I just wanna acknowledge the fact that you are the one who's paid the price. You've done what I need. You have lived perfectly, couldn't do it. You died, I'm gonna die, but you defeated death. I couldn't do that, you did that for me. And so God, I turn from my sin, I turn from my independence from you, and I turn and I trust in you. And so if that's you today, I, I pray that you're hearing God calling your name, just like he said, Mary, insert your name right now. He's looking at you, he's calling your name, saying, I know you, I see you, I love you. And I'm praying that your hearts would well up and say he knows me and he offers me hope and a future life and life eternally. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I'm just so grateful, I'm so grateful that you have given us this great story of Mary, someone who is so far from you, so far from you, and many in the world would say she's just too far gone. And you said, no, this is, this is perfect. This is a person who can't earn it, but I will give her freely hope and a, and a future. And I will take a, a seemingly nobody in the world and I'll make somebody of her because I have a great plan for her life. And God, I pray for those who are listening right now that they would hear that message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and they would have great hope and they would find great joy in the, the, the possibility of walking with God and, and having a relationship with God who, who knows their name. And so God, I pray that right now, if there is anybody who does not know you, has not uh, received that relationship with you that you're offering to them right now, that they would turn from sin and they would turn to you. Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord would be saved. So right now, would you call upon the name of the Lord? He's calling your name. Would you answer back and say, yes, Jesus, I want you. I want to turn from my independence from you, and I want to turn, and I want to trust in you. God, I pray for them right now. Do your work in their hearts and bring them from death to life. It was your death in place of our death and your life for our life. God, we're thankful. And so may we follow you. God, right now, I pray that you're bringing people into your family. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you sing with us?
All right, well, I hope that right now, so many of us are joyfully singing, I'm free because of what Jesus has done for us, I'm free. And some of you today, for the very first time, have experienced the freedom that comes from trusting in Jesus. And we just wanna celebrate that. In fact, what we're gonna do in just a moment, when we log off, we wanna encourage you uh, to, to follow that link that says connection card and just let us know what God's been doing in your heart today. Uh, maybe today, uh, you're, you're for the first time trusting in Jesus. Would you just check that box and let us know that? We'll send you some resources in the mail just to help you on that walk with Jesus, that new relationship with Jesus. If there's something for all of you that, that, that maybe we can be praying for in the comments prayer section, please let us know how we can be praying for you 
but everybody, if you would, just let us know that you're here with us by taking some time to fill out that connection card. That would be, that would be really great. We're just so glad that we could come together like this for Easter and just focus on Jesus and what he's done for us. Another way that we want to respond today is we love to respond with generosity. God has given us everything. He has spared not even his own son. And so we love to give back to him in generosity. And so you might want to notice there's a link there for you to uh, to give. If this is your church home and you want to give and just help us to, to do so much good. We've been able to do so much good during this corona season, stocking food pantries and providing meals for people and, and laptops for people for, for school. It's just been a really, really great season and uh, so much good has been done. And so I want to thank you guys for your generosity. And if you want to take some time to do that, there really are three ways that you can give. You can give through the Charles River Church app. Just click the give button there. You can give online or you can mail directly into the PO box. So take a minute with that if you'd like to do that as well. And so a big thank you for those of you guys who've been involved in helping us do good in this season. And then two quick reminders. First of all, River Kids, right after this, our River Kids have a link that you can click and and you can get them some fun activities and help them to grow in their walk with Jesus. And then secondly, uh, next week, we, we're doing this every week. We're online for, for the foreseeable future. And so I'd love to just invite you to come back and join us again. Uh, same place, same time, 10 a.m., 5 p.m., and just join us. And let's just continue to grow in our walk with Jesus, not just this one-time uh, Easter gathering. And so thank you guys so much for being with us. Just like a normal Sunday, if we were in person, rather than just taking off, would you just stay around for a little bit, interact in the chat section, just talk to some people, say hi. And again, we're so glad you're here. Blessings.